Welcome and thank you for joining today's supplemental cooperative agreements and other finance issues associated with a FMD response. Please note that all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We will provide you with instructions on how to ask a verbal question at that time. You're welcome to submit written questions during the presentation and these will be addressed during Q&A. To send a note, Select all panelists on the Send to drop-down menu of the chat panel located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. If you require technical assistance, send a note to the event producer or call our help desk at 888-796-6118. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Clark. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Clark with Professional Development Services, and I'd also like to welcome you to the webinar today. We have three speakers for today. Our first speaker is Joyce Nolte. She's the Director of Admin Services Center, Veterinary Service, SCRS, also the Veterinary Services ICG Finance and Admin Section Chief, and she's located in Fort Collins, Colorado. Next will be Carol Tuzinski, who is the Director of Planning, Finance, and Strategy Division, Veterinary Services, Professional Support Services. She's also the Veterinary Services ICG Budget Branch Chief and is located in Riverdale, Maryland. And our third speaker is going to be Pat Donahue Galvin, who is the Branch Chief Financial Services, Veterinary Services, Professional Support Services, and the Veterinary Services ICG Indemnity and Compensation Finance Branch Chief and is located in Riverdale, Maryland. Also on the call today and available to answer any of your questions is Donna Schultz, who's a supervisor of the agreements team, Vet Services, SPRS. She's also a member of the INT Gold Team, Document Unit Leader, and she's located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Charles Singer is with us today. He's the District Administrative Officer in Vet Services, SPRS, District 1. He's the Vet Services ICG Deputy Finance and Admin Section Chief, and he's located in Robbinsville, New Jersey. Also is Lawanda Amit. Director of Management Support Division, Veterinary Services, Professional Services Sup Support Services. She is the Vet Services ICG Admin Support Branch Chief and is located in Riverdale, Maryland. Marnie Davidson is with us today. She's the Senior Budget Analyst for Vet Services, Professional Support Services, and is the Veterinary Services ICG Deputy Budget Branch Chief and is located also in Riverdale, Maryland. And Linda Smith. She's a Supervisor for Financial Services Unit, Vet Services, SPRS, and is located in Riverdale, Maryland. Without further ado, I will pass the webinar over to Joyce Nolte. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Joyce Nolte, and it is my pleasure to share with you some of the financial processes during an emergency response activity. We'll talk about um, two main themes today. We're going to talk about supplemental cooperative agreements as well as the indemnity and compensation processes. But first, we'll, we'll get into supplemental cooperative agreements. Before we get too far, though, I want to dispel any mystery around the term supplemental cooperative agreements. There's really nothing special or different about a supplemental cooperative agreement from any other cooperative agreement. Um, APHIS Veterinary Services enters into agreements annually with many state animal health organizations for a variety of activities. We're referring to these agreements as supplemental cooperative agreements simply because it would be an additional agreement to what may already be in place with state entities. The same processes and paperwork is required with a supplemental emergency response cooperative agreement as it would be for, for an annual cooperative agreement. So that just kind of basic summary there. I'm gonna turn it over to Carol Tuzinski to share a little bit about federal emergency funding processes. Thanks, Joyce. Good afternoon, everybody. 
I'm going to say just a few words about uh, where the funding comes when we have an emergency, an animal health emergency. And there's really two main points that I want to go over. And I'm going to start really with what is on your screen in the third paragraph. So it's important to note first and foremost that um, the animal health emergencies fall outside of the Stafford Act and the, the disaster response emergencies that I know a lot of states are very familiar with and a lot of your uh, political leadership, your governors, et cetera, I'm sure are very, very aware of that process and very comfortable with that process, and they know the steps they need to take when they're in um, the throes of a, you know, a more of a disaster emergency. They know they have to do certain things in order to qualify for funding, and that does not apply and has never applied in animal health emergencies. We have our own ways that we can go about getting funding. So um, that often gets confusing at the beginning of an emergency and wanted to make sure that that was clear for folks right at the start here. And then jumping back up to the second paragraph, the other important note I wanted to make uh, today is that we do have some sources of funding that we can look towards during an emergency, an animal health emergency. Um, they do require us to go and, and apply for the funding and to get approval. So it's not money that APHIS has in the bank, so to speak. We have a little bit of money that is included in our annual appropriation in a contingency fund line that is there and available for us to use and helps us out to either get started with an event or um, to handle small events. But we don't have money just sitting in our annual appropriation to handle large disease emergencies. But there is a process. There are funds that we are allowed to ask to have um, provided to us, and we just have to go through the approval process, and that requires going up to the department and going over to OMB and notifying Congress. So there is a process. It's not just money that is sitting in our accounts. So again, those were the two points I wanted to make sure that we conveyed today on where the money um, comes from, from for disease emergencies. All right, thank you, Carol. So this next part of the cooperative agreement discussion is specific to allowable costs. There are some basic guidelines for any cooperative agreement. Um, there are two very important concepts. The one is only costs incurred as a direct result of the emergency in this scenario, but only cost incurred is directly outlined in a work plan, and in this scenario, work plan associated with an emergency are reimbursable. The second important concept to, to remember is that costs that might incur outside of an agreement time frame even though they might be relative to the emergency, cannot be reimbursed. For example, if we enter into an agreement today, April 24th, 2018, it's good for 12 months, which means it expires April 23rd, 2019. If costs were incurred prior to today, or after April 23rd, 2019, we could not reimburse them. So those two concepts are very important to remember. There are a lot of different types of costs that are allowable for reimbursement. They may not be the same in every emergency and in every location. Approved costs may be different because each scenario may be different. So let's talk about some of the more common costs. First, um, as you'll see on your screen, uh, is staffing. Salaries of existing state employees would not be covered by a supplemental cooperative agreement. Overtime costs, however, directly associated with the emergency event would be eligible for reimbursement. As well, salaries of new temporary personnel hired to assist solely in response activities might be reimbursable. Travel. 
travel, housing, and reasonable per diem costs incurred by state employees responding to an emergency outside of their normal district boundaries are reimbursable. Another common cost are set supplies and equipment, personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfection materials, shipping costs, outreach materials, et cetera, that are relative and as a direct result of the emergency would be coverable by a supplemental cooperative agreement. However, single purchases costing over $5,000 would need to be pre-approved. Communications and information technology needs may be reimbursable, again, if they are directly related to the emergency response in the work plan of the cooperative agreement. And there are resources beyond normal expenses they, that could be reimbursable. However, procurements of new IT systems or investments in major upgrades for existing systems would not be provided. If a state needs to set up an emergency operations center, the cost of leasing and outfitting that space with appropriate IT equipment could indeed be reimbursed. So similar to IT computer types of equipment, APHIS will not cover the cost of cell phones or lines already in place for normal use. But additional lines, phones, or usage costs that may incur because of the outbreak might be reimbursable. Contracts is another common expense that we often see in cooperative agreements. During emergency response activities, it's important to note that VS will normally enter into contracts directly with service providers or vendors. This could be for activities, as you see there on your screen, such as landfilling, supplying carbon sources for composting, transportation, et cetera. So while we would normally contract directly with a vendor, for those activities, it's possible that we can reimburse the state for contracted services already in place. Similar to supplies and equipment, though, if those single costs of contracting are more than $5,000, we would want to obtain pre-approval. Those are some of the more common expenses that we see in cooperative agreements. Um, as stated earlier, every cooperative agreement is different. Different, we enter into agreements with different cooperators, they're in different locations, scenarios may not be exact. So sometimes one location may have a cost that another location wouldn't have. What would be the same, though, in all situations is the cooperative agreement processes. So regardless of what type of cooperative agreement it is, if, it's, if we're calling that, using that term supplemental, or if you might have heard the term umbrella cooperative agreement, all of those processes run through the Easy Fed Grants online system. Detailed work and financial plans um, are, are necessary and required, as well as quite a few other documents. So on your uh, screen now, you'll see a list of several documents that are required in order to process a cooperative agreement. 
Duns and SAM registrations, decision memos, the 424 packages, the disclosure for lobbying, and, and so forth. Some of that, those requirements occur outside of EC Fed grants, and some requirements occur inside of EC Fed grants. Those are, that's kind of the basic concepts of cooperative agreements. I'm not sure if anyone has specific questions regarding the documents and easy fed grants processes. If so, we've got Donna Schultz on the line who is our, our expert in all of that and can respond. Or if there are other questions that you might have about allowances and funding. So far, we don't have any written um, questions, Joyce. Okay, so if you do have a question, and it's a verbal question, please be sure to press pound two on your telephone keypad, and you'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, you can state your name and question. Again, as a reminder for written questions, you can select all panelists on the Send To drop-down menu of the chat panel, located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And it looks like we have one question there in the chat, I do believe. Yes. Does APIS require a SAM account and a DUNS number for reimbursement of backyard poultry or livestock owners? So the DUNS and SAM registration is strongly recommended for everyone, including backyard poultry folks. Um, there are exemptions to, um, to having to do that. Um, it is a little more paperwork perhaps, uh, but uh, that is something that um, would, is best strongly encouraged by uh, federal agencies to, to register in, with Duns and Sam. And we do have another question. Um, what is the pre-approval, I'm sorry, um, all of a sudden all these questions started coming in. What is the process for getting pre-approval for an expense in excess of $5,000 during an event? So the cooperator would need to communicate with um, the federal agent uh, at the time. That could be a variety of people depending upon the size of the emergency. Um, it could be the assistant director in the state. It could be the incident commander at the IMT. Uh, it, it, it could be... Uh, someone else, uh, but whoever that identified federal person is at the time, simply need to communicate with that person. Um, once an agreement is actually established, there will be an identified program manager who most likely will be the assistant director uh, in SPURS. It might not be, but in most scenarios, I would expect that it would be, and that would be the person that you communicate with on any costs during the agreement time frame. We have another question. If the county were to provide assistance by providing GIS support and printing maps to assist with the response, would those costs be able to be recouped in a cooperative agreement? I'm so sorry, Liz. Could you respond to that? I missed the first part. Sure. If the county were to provide assistance by providing GIS support and printing maps to assist with a response, would those costs be able to be recouped in a cooperative agreement? Oh, okay, I see. If a county incurred costs. Um, it's, it's possible. Um, as mentioned earlier, every scenario and every location and every cooperator will be different. But if a state works very closely with the county and the county is also responding to the emergency, 
the work plan clearly identifies that um, assistance from the county um, would be, you know, would be looked for. Um, it is a possibility. Um, I could not guarantee a broad uh, question like that, but it certainly could be discussed and possibly approved. The next written question is, are pre-award letters used to start a cooperative agreement for an FMD response? Uh, the reason they're asking is it may take time to know what the cooperative agreement will cover. So a pre-award letter is used to ensure that the cooperator could be reimbursed. So I mentioned kind of at the top of the discussion that reimbursement could not take place outside of the cooperative agreement time frame. However, especially during an emergency response activity, it's not always possible to get that actual cooperative agreement documentation in place so quickly. With a pre-award letter, if we could get that in place quicker, it is much quicker to get to process. That guarantees that this start date today, April 24th, we will indeed, you know, any costs incurred from today on. Without the pre-award letter, then the cost that you might be incurring couldn't be reimbursed because the start date of the agreement, you know, might be a month or two out. I hope that answered that question. I'm not, I'm not sure. Please feel free to help, you know, let me clarify. There's another written question. It says, did you say that we actually could provide equipment like cell phones? And if so, does then the state own that equipment? So, yes, cell phone costs for, that are in addition to what is already provided um, to employees. It's perhaps for new temporary employees uh, could be approved. That is correct. Would the state own the equipment? Um, not necessarily. Um, one time cost, and again, I don't know if it would be for one cell phone or a hundred cell phones. Any one time cost that might be at five thousand dollars or more are normally considered the ownership with the federal government. Arrangements can be made between the program manager and the signatory official, as well as with the cooperator, to decide if the federal government still needs those items or if they could remain with the state cooperator. Okay, um, right now we don't have any other written questions. Are there any verbal questions in the queue? So it does look like we have one written question at the moment. I'll go to that. Caller, your line is unmuted. I'm sorry, Joyce, this is Sherry Healy. Um, I, had, I wrote the question, but I have a follow-up question. So as concerning the cell phones, would it just be for any, they're just supposed to use it during the time of the outbreak, is that correct? That would be the initial intent. That is correct, Sherry, yes. Yeah. So that it would be utilized only for um, what is specifically in the work plan of the agreement. And in the scenario we're talking about, you're right, it's an, an emergency cooperative agreement. Okay. So then, then I have another written that. question. Well, go ahead, I'm sorry. After the emergency is over, then that's when we make the decision if they want to keep that equipment, we discuss it after the outbreak's over or when before close out of the cooperative agreement? That would be correct, yes. That would 
be when the program manager and the cooperator will, would need to communicate, you know, does, um, is there justification for the cooperator, the state, to, to keep the equipment? Um, would it make more sense for us to, to keep the cell phones or, or other expensive equipment? Um, yeah, I wish it was more cut and dried and with every single scenario we could say yes or no, black or white. Um, but unfortunately it's not that way. So, but, but you're right, it's, it's possible it could go either way depending upon the scenario and the circumstances at that time. Okay, the, the question of the expense of the line itself, owning that number, we have that expense we can add that to that to activate the phone. So if, there are, if there are additional lines, yeah, if there are, if additional lines are needed, and um, especially when a, a new emergency operations center might need to be opened up in a new location during that emergency time frame and that emergency operations center, you know, while it's open, it is possible that we could reimburse for new lines. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hey, hey Joyce, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. You know, can I, can I uh, add a comment in regard to the pre-award letter? Of course, yes, thank you. Yeah, so the other important thing that needs to be known, um, and as Joyce indicated early in the, in the, the, the com or her lecture section there, is that, as she said, not every cost is allowable and is different for every scenario that we, we get engaged in. And so it's important to know that even though you have a pre-war letter in place that allows you to incur costs, not every cost might have been negotiated by the time the pre-war letter was approved. So, and, and there's a statement in there that states that the, either the agreement is reduced or certain costs are not allowed, then it would be the responsibility of the state. But what the important part of the pre-award letter is, as she indicated, it allows you to start work and, and incur costs during the uh, performance cycle, which may not, the agreement itself may not have been finalized. Uh, so that's the important part. And if a pre-award letter is not in place, then normally the cost can't be reimbursable until the day of the final signature of the, of the, um, the well, we used to be called ADO, but um, so that's the important part on the pre-award letter is that it just allows you to do work right away, but you may not be reimbursed for every cost because all those costs may not have been negotiated yet. That is excellent clarification, Charlie. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. We have one more written question, Joyce. It's how about reimbursement for state-owned equipment costs? hourly slash daily rates on DPOP, DECON equipment, mileage, et cetera? That's an excellent question. So state-owned equipment and usage of that equipment on during the emergency, could those usage costs, miles, gasoline, et cetera, perhaps be reimbursed? From an administrative standpoint, the response is yes. Those types of costs can be reimbursed. But again, and I'm so sorry that I can't be more concrete, you would need to discuss all of those types of costs, the myriad of types of costs that might be reimbursable and agree, have a clear agreement of that in the work and financial plan. It does look like we have a uh, another question in the verbal question queue. All right, I'll go to that line. Caller, your line is unmuted. Okay, hi Joyce, this is Troy Bigelow. I was the individual that asked the pre-award question. So when we roll out, let's say we roll a team out for an FMD response, should that be one of the things right at the top of our list to work with the state veterinarian on is a pre-award letter to ask them if they're going to want a cooperative agreement. 
And yeah, then what will be Troy, the that would young... be, that'd be very important. Okay. I, I would say that definitely yes, that would be one thing that, that would you might want to start talking about within the first few days of an emergency response. You know, is a supplemental agreement going to be needed? And if so, getting that pre-award letter in place as quickly as possible um, so that, you know, when, as Charlie mentioned, when the final costs are approved and the agreement is in place, we can start reimbursing the state from that time frame rather than the time frame when the actual agreement gets signed. Okay, at this time I don't have any more um, written questions. Okay, I do think that we have one more question coming in here on the phone. Who would, your line is unmuted. Who would be the appropriate person to contact the SAHO in this case? Well, so that's going to be dependent upon the size of an emergency. Um, I do expect that in, in any um, emergency, or I, I should say most, and in, and in most scenarios, that the assistant director will still be the program manager for that cooperative agreement. And I say that because IMT personnel come and go, right, every three weeks or so. And um, agreement processes last for months. And so my thought process for the assistant director to be that program manager assigned to the agreement is because that person will be there for the long haul to follow through and, and you know, work with the FLAHO until the actual agreement is, is closed out. So that would be my initial response. However, if we are hot and heavy in an emergency, similar to where we were in 2015 with High Path, it's very possible that initial discussions and probable initial discussions are going to um, take place with either the IC or someone on the IMT designated by the IC. Uh, so in, initial discussions with a cooperator may not necessarily be the AD, but I do think that it, there is a lot of logic in having that assistant director be the long-term program manager identified on the agreement. Okay, thank you. Sure. Joyce, this is Donna Schultz. Hi, Donna. And I wanted, hi, and I just wanted to give some clarification to the gentleman that asked about the pre-approval for an expense in excess of $5,000. Yes, please. And just that how we require that pre-approval is a written request coming in from that recipient giving justification for the item that would be over $5,000. And that is all we would need to start that process. Good deal. Thank you. Sure. All right. So we do have one more written question that just came in. It's a follow-up on the equipment question. Would the cost also be reimbursable for repair slash replacement of state equipment damaged in the event? That's another, that's another good question. So, and I'm assuming this is cost of own equipment that might have been damaged uh, during, during the uh, event. So replacing damaged equipment actually falls under claims for federal government um, and not necessarily reimbursable through a property agreement. So if equipment was damaged by, if state equipment, say, which was damaged by a state employee, I, I wouldn't think that reimbursement would occur. 
if a federal employee was using the state equipment and a federal employee caused the damage, then I would suspect that through the tort claims processes, that reimbursement would occur. But normal wear and tear on equipment that you might use under a cooperative agreement would probably not normally be reimbursed. Do we have any additional questions? No further questions at this time. Okay, then I think we should go ahead and go forward with the rest of the presentation. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Patricia Donahue-Galvin to talk about indemnity and compensation processes. Thank you, Joyce. Yes, I wanted to go over um, the processes and the information that is needed for USDA uh, BS um, to make indemnity and compensation payments to stakeholders affected by um, FMD. And I wanted to start off with uh, talking a little bit about the first steps that take place um, uh, at, the, at the beginning of uh, an identified um, incurrence on a particular producer's um, premise. Um, when the response, start, the response starts as soon as a case is suspected on a premise, um, there are trained personnel that go to the premise, collect samples for testing, and then they send it to uh, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network Lab um, for confirmation um, that it is, in fact, FMD. Um, when that becomes positive, if that is a positive, um, if the results are positive, it becomes a presumptive positive case, and it's then forwarded to uh, the National Veterinary Services Lab Laboratories um, as soon as possible. Um, for confirmation. But in the meantime, as soon as the presumptive uh, positive case is identified, um, the USDA, USDA case manager is assigned to the producer to work with them um, in throughout the, the indemnity and compensation process. Um, they work as a liaison um, with the producer to get the information necessary and completed and documented so that it can um, uh, be processed through various levels um, uh, so that payment can be uh, approved and, and paid. Um, <clears throat> and this information is um, all part of an appraisal process um, at which is the data is collected um, and an appraisal form is filled out and sent for approval. The Animal Health Protection Act authorizes USDA to provide indemnity payments to producers for animals and products that must be destroyed during a disease response. APHIS also provides compensation for depopulation and disposal activities. <clears throat> While the cost of FMD will go well beyond the value of destroyed herds and cleanup work, our ability to pay indemnity is limited by specific terms in the Animal Health Protection Act. We are allowed to pay for indemnity and compensation for costs directly associated with the outbreak, such as the destruction of animals and products and for depop and disposal. We are not, however, um, able to offer indemnity for income or production losses suffered 
due to downtime or other business disruptions. When, in, when indemnity or compensation is, um, is going to be paid, the caseworker needs um, some information, a lot of information from the producer um, in order to complete uh, an appraisal, the appraisal form and send it for um, decision making um, in, within VS. Some of that information that is needed, um, some examples are the species and herd, herd type, production records, product inventory is very important, um, and of course, claimant name and address, um, and you can see the rest of the list there. A prem premise ID will be assigned to each premise where there is a, a positive, um, a pro positive incident. And in addition to all of this, again, the DUNS number and SAMS registration is needed and would, will be part of the appraisal form. Without it, we can't even um, begin to process or um, make decisions on indemnity payments. So receiving the payment upon approval requires the DUNS uh, number and SAMS registration. In the DUNS number is a standard business identifier. Many of the producers probably already have a DUNS number. Um, if they're already participating in a USDA program, for certain they wouldn't have uh, already have the DUNS number in order to, to receive payment. And it's uh, it's not a an USDA um, requirement for DUNS and SAMS. Um, it's actually a federal wide requirement. The U.S. Code of Federal Regulations and the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act require that indemnity claimants have a DUNS number and be currently registered um, in the SAMS database to receive payments. After receiving the number, oh, I'm sorry, uh, if, if a, a producer does not yet have a DUNS number or if they have a DUNS number and it's not registered yet in SAMS, that is something that the, um, the case manager can help them um, to obtain and there at the bottom of the page, at the bottom of the screen, um, is a link that um, can be used in order to um, register their DUNS number in SANS. And it, uh, an, an important note to this process is that getting and registering a DUNS number um, takes some time. Um, it can take longer than seven business days um, if all of the information is available and correct, correctly um, entered into the application for Duns and Sands. Um, if there is uh, a problem with some information, it will be kicked out and then needs to um, be corrected and go through the process again. <laughs> until it can finally be cleared. Um, so, in in the good in a in a good scenario, um, it generally can take longer than seven days, and 
there have been cases where it has taken a little longer than that. So um, it's, it's recommended that producers have a DUNS, and SAMS, a DUNS number and SAMS registration um, as early as possible. <clears throat> Are there any uh, are there any questions about the indemnity and compensation process? Hey, Pat, this is Charlie. Could I add to the SAMS and DUNS issue? Sure. Yeah, and this is just because it happened to us with an indemnity case here. It's very important that the name and, uh, on the indemnity form and the address matches the SAMS and DUNS. Sometimes we get those. Uh, they get provided the SAMs and DUNS, and when it gets ready to be processed for payment, it didn't match the name or address that was on the indemnity. So we need to, it's important that those two do uh, match when it's put, in, uh, put into the system. Thank you. That's, that's true. Thank you. Okay, and as a reminder, you can press pound two on your telephone keypad if you have a verbal question, or select all panelists in the send to drop down menu if you have a written question. We do have one written question that just came in. How does the seven plus days to receive a DUNS number to receive payments for indemnity influence the speed at which an appraisal can be performed for rapid depopulation of animals at risk? Well, it doesn't, it, uh, it could delay the payment. It doesn't delay the, the depopulation. So um, we, that's why we emphasize the need to identify the information for the appraisal um, as quickly as possible. And part of that information is getting and registering a DUNS number. Um, and I would also emphasize that the, the help of the case manager, um, who more than likely has been through this before, um, and like Charlie said, you know, needs, would know that the address for the claimant needs to match the address for the company that, that um, applied for who is the company tied to a particular DUNS number, the addresses need to match. So the, the, the case manager um, plays a really important role in this in helping the producer um, in trying to, um, you know, get him, he or she through, you know, potential um, hiccups or road bumps um, to make the system, uh, the process run smoothly and quickly. Okay, we do have another written question. Um, is there a DUN slash SAMS required if a state agency is contracted and or EMAC to respond to and assist another state or USDA? I would think if there if there's payment to the state involved, as you know, Joyce mentioned with um, cooperative agreements, I mean, there's a done SAMS needed there. So it, basically, any federal payment to anybody needs a done SAMS. So if, if okay. in that scenario, if the, if it's a request for the federal government to make a payment, and I don't know the particulars, but then a done SAMS number would, a done SAMS requirement would need to be met. Okay. Do we have any verbal questions? And I'm not seeing any verbal questions at the moment. Okay, we don't seem to have any additional written questions. 
I think we might have one coming in. Maybe not. So I think I think we do have a verbal question here. I'll go ahead and unmute that okay. line. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hello? And caller, please be sure that your device is also unmuted. Sorry. Sorry. This is Sherry Healy. It's not really a question so much as a clarification. Um, we have been teaching reimbursement specialists, and we've got 20 or so, and they're scattered all the way across the country. When possible, rather than the case manager do this, we have people trained especially to, to do the financial end of it. So that might be something we want to consider. They're trying to help the producer get the Duns and Sam set up. Um, we have hotlines where we can usually get Duns and Sam in an emergency set up within about 24 hours or so. So, oh. um, go ahead. No, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I did not realize that, but that's good news, yeah. Well, it came about because we have too many different messages going out through case managers. So we developed a, a separate training for the case managers and turned all the financial stuff over to a group that answers to the commodities lead in the ICG. So it cut out a lot of the complications over what we could um, safely say we would pay for. We were running into problems where one case manager would say we will pay for that and another one would say we can't. Or worse yet, we would tell the owners that we would pay for it, and then when it got up to Patty, then we would find out that was something we couldn't legally pay for. So it just made it easier to go ahead and, and pick a group of people and scatter them all across the country, and they're trained just to do this sort of thing. There are occasions when we will need to pull the case managers in um, because we don't have enough to go to every single outbreak, depending on how large it is, whether it's, but always there are two or three people that can be assigned to the case that can handle it from a distance, all except for getting the owner signatures. And we'll have to ask case managers to be the go-between on those. We ran it all through plans. Plans helped us develop the training for the case managers and for uh, the financial reimbursement specialist, we went through finance on that to find out exactly what we could teach and what we couldn't teach. So I think we're working on our process flow for this outbreak, and we'll get that out there pretty quick so everybody will know what we know. Does that help? Okay, great. Yes, very much. Thank you. Okay, we do have a couple more uh, written questions. Um, there's a follow-up on the last question. Once a DUNS slash SAMS was established for a 2015 event, does the ID continue then for future or later events? In other words, does establishing a DUNS slash SAMS remain in perpetuity for an assisting state agency? Well, the DUNS, the DUNS is a one-time registration, um, and the SAMS is an initial registration and then annual renewal. So, uh, it, and, it, and with that renewal, of course, you can update, make changes such as your, your banking information. Um, but so the DUNS, the answer is yes for DUNS, it's a one time, um, but SAMS is annual. Okay. The next question is how many finance specialists do we have currently trained and how many are awaiting training? Are you, is this finance um, in, the, in the field or in the ICG? I'm wondering if this is uh, referring to what Sherry um, Healy was just talking about. 
Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sherry, I would have to defer to you. It's pound two if you want to open your line. I do believe I see that line. I'll go ahead and unmute it. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, right now we have about 20 or so. Kim, do you remember 23? Well, she's, she's muted also. Okay, we have about, I, I think from the last class that we did in November or so, we had about 23. And are there still people waiting to be trained? Um, actually, something happened this year, and I didn't see on the list that we were going to do a class this year. Somehow it got dropped off the list. We are going to do the case manager class again. Um, if we need more, and I think we do, obviously, I think we need three or four in every state. But I, I want to have more training, but somehow it got dropped off the radar this year, so we'll put it up for request to teach it again next year. Yeah, let's get that on the PDS schedule um, for 2019. Might be a good idea because we're going through all of our class schedules now for FY 2019. Okay. I'm not sure what we need to do to do that, but okay. I'll, I'll, check, with, um, I'll okay. check with some folks and we'll see. We'll see what we can do about that. Okay? okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so I have another question, another one, a uh, written question. Is the case manager training available to state designees? I, I don't know. Liz, I'm not sure either. Yeah, this is Joyce. Uh, since you're Liz, since you're part of the uh, PDS training, folks, that'd probably be one for you, maybe to talk with uh, with everyone to see if it's something we could open the state. I I don't know if that's done or not. I do see. I believe Sherry may have some input here. I'll go ahead and open her line and just I'll keep her line open. We have somebody asked about the case manager class. We have another one scheduled for July. I don't think we've sent out notification right. yet on it. Was there a question of one minute? It has not been paper? sent out. But Sherry, are are is that available to state as a uh, state folks? Yes, um, if we know about it ahead of time and can set up everything. Um, if they want the training, that was another reason that we discussed having a separate financial area because there were some concerns about um, state telling uh, premise owners what we were paying for certain things. So by cutting the financial reimbursement out of that, we can include as long as we know about it ahead of time and can set it up. We've had a lot of requests from states that want to train case managers. It's also something that we've talked about. We have, um, we tried to send home enough material that local states can teach a, a pretty good case manager class in their state. So that's what we're aiming for, is to get enough people, enough trainers out there that they are comfortable with going and presenting to states. Nobody has a travel budget anymore, including the states. So sometimes that's the best way to get our states trained. Okay. Well, we're just about um, we're at the top of the hour. So if there aren't any other questions, um, I think we should probably call it a day. And I think there was a lot of great questions that were asked. I will get a copy of all those questions. So we, I will send those out to the speakers just in case there's other information that you might want to um, 
right to the people that were asking the questions. Um, there is one more written question, and so we'll go ahead and take this. Has the USDA APHIS Vet Services Cooperative Agreement handout slash guide been updated? Yes, it was updated in, and sent out, I believe, in January of this year. Okay. Okay. Okay, here's one more. <laughs> Oh, does APHIS have any pre-established reimbursement rates for equipment and or mileage? And if so, where can we find it? Um, I would defer to Donna on this question. I, I'm going to say no, that there's really not pre-established reimbursement rates for, for cooperative agreements. But um, Donna, you might have some details on that. Sure. Um, the reimbursement rates are based on state per diem if they've got a written state per diem policy. Generally, that's what we follow. If they do not, then it falls to the federal per diem policy that we have. Those are the rates that we would use. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for um, joining us today for this webinar. I think there was a lot of good discussion. Um, we had a lot of people on the webinar. I just want to let everyone know that's still on. We do have three more webinars coming up. Lisa Keyrose is going to present the planning P part two on Monday, April 30th at 11 a.m. On Wednesday, Lisa will also be back with us presenting the planning P part three on May 2nd at 11 a.m. And on Thursday, May 3rd at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Dr. John Zach and Dr. Fred Bourgeois will be presenting the second webinar on resources. I will be sending out friendly reminders and announcements regarding those webinars in the next couple of days. So thanks, everyone. Hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you for today's conference. The session is now concluded, and you may disconnect.